Thank you all for being here. My apologies for the delay. We have um, some people who have been very, very affected by what occurred on the street. Um, I was in the back consulting with them, and it took a minute. So thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. We are here today to discuss a collaborative community response to Monday's mass shooting here in the King Sessing community. This breaks down into several parts, but the essence of it is this. This is really not my time to talk and talk and talk. This is the time for a lot of other people who are affected by what occurred and who work to try to make it better now as much as they can and to try to make it better in the future. This is their opportunity to talk and it's their opportunity for the public to understand that an entire community does come together despite the horrific trauma of this nightmarish mass shooting. Someone back there while we were getting ready said the bullets don't care, but we do. I'd say that's about right. The bullets don't care, but we do. And I know the rest of this city does, and I know the rest of this country does. I want to identify some of the good people who are here today, many of whom will be speaking. We have ADA Joanne Pescator, who is the chief of the DAO's homicide and non-fatal shooting unit. We have the prosecutor specifically assigned to this case and assigned to the case from the beginning, and that is ADA Bob Wainwright of the DAO's homicide non-fatal shooting unit. We have with us the Reverend Myra Maxwell, director of the DAO's Victim Support Services Division, uh, who has done incredible work with her team to try to reach out to so many different victims, survivors, co-survivors, and families affected by this tragedy. Reverend Maxwell is here with Shekina DeShazer, who is the administrative manager of the DAO's CARES unit. Now, the CARES unit is the subpart of the victim witness unit in the DA's office that is specifically tasked with working intensively with the families of homicide victims in the first 45 days. Just imagine for a second what it's like when you can't afford the funeral, what it's like when you feel that you're in danger, what it's like when all that grief is crushing you and causing health problems in your family. Just imagine what it's like to try to deal with all the immediate logistics and simultaneously try to find a way in the future to address your own trauma. Well, that's the kind of work that is done by Reverend Maxwell, Shakina DeShazor, and we also have Shalin Harris, who is a victim witness coordinator specifically working in our homicide non-fatal shooting unit and specifically working on this particular case. Aunt Brown, Anthony Brown, Aunt Brown is here for ABRO, that's A-B-R-O, which is an anti-gun violence organization that works in schools, as you may know. Uh, a lot of juveniles have been affected very directly and indirectly by this, and we appreciate his work, appreciate his being here. We have several members of the DAO's LGBTQ plus liaison uh, group, uh, some of whom are also victim witness coordinators, and they include Kelly Burkhart, who is a victim witness coordinator in the DA's office. In addition to filling this role, we have Asa Khalif, Mr. Khalif, I mean, frankly, I shouldn't have to introduce him. He should be so well known to many of you for his remarkable work as an activist and in many other ways. Uh, we also have the wonderful Sappho Fulton and Micah Thomas here on behalf of that group. Our Sheriff Rochelle Bilal is here. Senator Sharif Street of PA Senate District 3, who has done so much with his colleagues in the Senate to try to address issues of gun violence and issues of prevention around gun, vi gun violence is here. We have um, Dr. Zaf Qasim, that Z-A-F, next name Qasim, Q-A-S-I-M, who is a medical doctor and emergency physician from Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. 
He is here with registered nurse Stephanie Horton, also works in emergency at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. And both of these individuals have come here to tell you what it was like to treat many of the injured um, in the emergency room on the night that occurred and to speak more generally about the reality that their everyday situation is gun violence victims coming in for years. Dr. Kasim has been doing this work at Penn Pres Presbyterian for eight years, but he has been a doctor for 22 years. We have with us Vofi Jabatet, who is the executive director of ACANA, that's A-C-A-N-A. A-C-A-N-A is the Africa Cultural Alliance of North America. The offices of ACANA are very close to where this incident occurred, and Vofi is very well known. Some call him the mayor up here, um, the mayor of that neighborhood anyway. Vofi is very well known and played an important role here in assisting the DA's office in reference to one of the homicide victims who is the son of an immigrant from Africa. He is present. We have Reverend W. Lonnie Herndon, senior pastor of the Church of Christian Compassion, who has worked, collaborated with us many times and, among other things, is providing assistance to one of the families to deal with one of the most traumatic aspects of the aftermath of the shooting. We have Imam Kenneth Nordin of the Philadelphia Masjid, whose anti-gun violence work is constant. And we have the Reverend Dr. Sean James, senior pastor here at the Salt and Light Church, which is our host. Uh, in the back at this time, we also have Josephine Wama, uh, and we have Jasmine Wama, who are the two sisters of one of the homicide victims. Uh, if they are able, they will be speaking today. And if they are not able, you will understand the reality of what they're up against. So let me just say a couple words, because it really should only be a couple words before we hear more from community. As many of you are aware, there were a lot of people who came to the scene of this crime yesterday within several hours of the shooting itself. Um, my office at that time had fully deployed our CARES team, our victim witness coordinators team, who immediately got in contact with the families of all of the victims of this shooting, with the exception of the one young man who had not been identified at the time. As soon as he was identified, they kicked into gear to address that. While we were out at the scene yesterday, um, we were accompanied by leader Joanna McClinton, um, who is the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House, Representative Jordan Harris, who is essentially her right hand, the number two in the Pennsylvania House for the Democrats. Councilmember Catherine Gilmore Richardson was there. Councilmember Jamie Gautier was there by phone. She was actually um, a couple thousand miles away, but wanted to know everything that was going on, and we were in close contact. Vofi Jabata of Akana was there as well. Reverend G. Lamar Stewart was there as well. And we were all struck by many things, but just one of those things was the bicycle, which is still there. I don't know if you saw it, but right at the corner where this all went down, yesterday, 24 hours ago, actually 28 hours ago, there was a, a small bicycle, looked like a child's bicycle, which was sitting on that corner. And we were informed by some people who were there that that bicycle was dropped by someone, I presume a child, during the shooting. Hours later, nobody had touched it. Nice little bike. Hours later, nobody had touched it as if they all felt they couldn't, that it was a memorial. It was some kind of a silent memorial. Well, it's there now. It's been moved a few feet. Maybe somebody came along, some child came along and moved it, and somebody else told them to put it back. But it's there now. And I, I think that that fact the desolation on those streets, the absence of cars, the absence of people, the curtains closed, the doors locked in that neighborhood, and also the comments from neighbors, the ones who did come out, about how close they themselves came to being shot and killed. Thank goodness I didn't go get that bag out of my trunk right then because those are the kinds of things that we heard. Obviously, this office is 100% committed to the vigorous prosecution 
of this mass killer. And we will do justice in court with this case. But it's not my time to keep talking. It's my time to call forward some people who have, in my opinion, very important things to say. It is my pleasure, my honor first, to call forward Zaf Qasim, MD, an emergency physician from Penn Presbyterian, as well as registered nurse um, <clears throat> Stephanie Horton, to speak as much as they wish and as little as they wish about their experience and their thoughts about this incident. Thank you, uh, D.A. Kresner. Uh, my name is uh, Zach Kassim. I am an emergency room physician and an ICU physician at uh, Penn Presbyterian, and I'm here with my colleague, Stephanie Wharton, who's a registered nurse also in the emergency room at Penn Presbyterian. And, uh, Certainly would like to start um, to thank the DA for the invitation to speak today. Also, our deepest condolences to everybody who was affected by the tragedy that happened on uh, Monday night. Uh, the, the families in particular uh, wanted to also thank the uh, Philadelphia police officers who, uh, whilst taking fire, uh, were rapidly able to get uh, the victims of this uh, insanity that happened on Monday to Penn Presby uh, in a very timely fashion. And we're also able to limit the uh, additional loss of life on the scene by apprehending the suspect very quickly. Um, and most importantly, I think I'd like to thank my colleagues who uh, I'm representing here today and Stephanie as well, who uh, came together on that night um, with very little notice and were able to uh, effectively and rapidly provide um, life-saving care to the victims who arrived. And uh, some of the details are already made public to the press. I won't uh, go into any further details on any specific patient. Um, you know, this is uh, really kind of a tragedy that we're here. Um, we, as a team at uh, Penn Presby, deal with gun violence, not just on Monday night, but uh, on an everyday basis. Um, especially over the last few years, we've seen a huge escalation in the amount of gun violence that we're seeing. It's not uncommon to see multiple victims who come in. Despite that, what happened on Monday was uh, perhaps on a scale far above what we've seen before. Um, from the degree of injury that we saw, the, from the style of weapon that was used, and the amount of damage. And remember, this isn't something that uh, just affects the victims. As I said to the DA, the bullets really don't care. They don't care what faith you are, what party you belong to they cause damage, not only to the victims, but to the families who we then have to go to talk to in the family rooms, and the wider community, as you saw, where the streets are now empty uh, because people are scared to go out in the street. Let me hand it over to Nurse Horton. I just would like to echo what Dr. Katzen said about the families. It's just really hard to comfort them. Um, and it really takes a, a toll on our co my colleagues. And to go through this, like Dr. Kassim said, very frequently, um, it just doesn't get any doesn't get any easier. Thank you for that. <clears throat> thank you for the work you do, and thank you for highlighting what the police went through with this horrifying incident, where they were the ones scooping up victims with no cover, while shots were ringing out, and then working all night, and then coming back with no sleep or almost no sleep the next day. It is my pleasure now to call up Reverend Myra Maxwell, Director of the DAO's Victim Support Services Division with her team, and that includes Shakina DeShazor. Uh, I think Shaolin Harris may actually be occupied. Oh, Shaolin Harris is available? Okay. And Shaolin Harris, if she is available as well. Thank you, D.A. Krasner. First, I'd like to say on behalf of our Victim Support Services Division, we'd like to also offer our condolences to the family members who tragically had their loved ones taken from them through this incident, as well as those who are survivors of 
these, this horrible event that happened to us. I want to just kind of move past what Dr. Kassam said that they're working at the hospital, but our CARES unit is actually uh, following up in the immediate aftermath of a homicide uh, tragedy. So our teams are activated by our um, manager, who's not up here with me, but she is in the audience. Um, they're activated, and once they're activated, they are deployed to either the hospital or to the, um, the location where the tragedy occurred. Our team was able to pull two teams together to go out to speak with these families to make sure that they are offered services immediately in the aftermath of this homicide uh, death. Unfortunately, we have to do this quite a bit here in the city of Philadelphia, and we hope uh, that we won't have to do that that much. So we're looking one day that you all can put us out of business. However, in the immediate aftermath, there are so many issues that families have to deal with. We're there to not just offer the, the immediate support, but to make sure we help them to navigate the numerous systems that they have to navigate. Uh, that could be assisting with funeral expenses. It could be helping them to obtain counseling support or any other types of services. Because once there's a loss, there are many people impacted, as we've heard here already. So we have to consider there are children involved, there are other family members involved, there are neighbors involved, and the community. And our office is offering what we, I like to call it a continuum of support, because not only is our CARES unit out to be deployed in the immediate aftermath, but if there's an arrest in the case, our homicide uh, victim witness court, uh, coordinators, as well as our non-fatal shooting coordinators, are there to support the family through the criminal justice process. There's also another component because we also work with community-based providers. So not only are we working alongside of our community-based based providers, but we're also making certain that the community is cared for. Because in the aftermath of such a tragedy such as this or any incident, the community is absolutely impacted. So the trauma is going from not just the family to the community, even to those who are providing the service. We are impacted by this as well. So so our continuum of services, again, reaches out to not just um, the immediate family, but also to those fam people who are impacted in the community, as well as those who are serving. So we do have information on some of the other organizations, including our network of neighbors who provide trauma support to the community. So we have reached out to these organizations already to make sure that we are touching every single aspect of this particular traumatic event. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to call forward Asa Khalif to say a couple words on behalf of a whole team who are here, which is the DAO's LGBTQ plus advisory committee. Um, what, as wonderful as his speaking is, it should not be necessary, but you know, um, there are some people for whom hate is a full-time job. And if they can stay away from the facts and talk about nonsense, that's what they're gonna do. We will have more to say about this if there's any need to say it, but there really shouldn't be. Nevertheless, I call forward Asa Khalif. Thank you very much, Mr. District Attorney. Um, we are members of the District Attorney's LGBTQIA Advisory Committee. Uh, we have done wonderful work within our community in educating the District Attorney's Office um, and connecting them with our community is the first that has ever been ha uh, done in the district attorney's office, and we are very proud of the success that we've had moving forward. I'm not going to take a lot of time because we have some pressing issues here. First and foremost, we would like to give our deepest condolences to the, vic um, the victim's family. We want to lift the victims up in our thoughts and honor them even though they died in a tragic way, their lives mattered, and the impact of the community. This is a community that we belong to. We used to live, some of us lived in this community before we moved to other communities in Philadelphia. It has impacted us. We have family members. So it's a triple effect. It just doesn't stop with the shooter uh, being arrested. There is a triple down effect and it affects all of us as a community and keep us all as a city in our prayers. 
I want to discuss very briefly because there is a nasty, violent, in terms of verbal and written words, um, spewed by the conservative press um, regarding the shooter. There are certain pictures that are circulating. Some of you may are, be aware of those pictures. Uh, have the, the shooter in one picture as male and other pictures dressed in female uh, attire or female um, outfits. They have used those pictures to attack trans people and particularly trans women of color which are extremely vulnerable uh, to violence in our community. I want to set the record straight because language is extremely important when we're talking about anything dealing with violence in trans community. The suspect or the shooter has not identified themselves as trans. They have only identified themselves as male. And that's the language that will be used until further developments if they change that type of language. But the language that is spewed out by the conservative press is violent and is dangerous and is targeting trans women of color. It's rallying the community to be violent. And we're bitter than that. We're better than that. We have our trans women and our trans men living in these communities, working, thriving in the communities. They are not killers. They are the most vulnerable to violence. They want to live their lives, and they have every right to do so. And we will not allow conservative bigots to use that type of language to attack trans people. This is about someone who used violence to hurt and harm our city and our community. And I'm sure they will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. But we will not allow trans women, and trans women in particular, trans women of color, to be the scapegoat for bigots. There is no room for that. We will not allow it. Thank you. I want to make sure to point out that accompanying Mr. Khalif were Sappho Fulton, dressed in white. We also had Kelly Burkhart, who works in the DA's office, and we had Micah Thomas who is standing uh, to your right, my left. The next group I'm honored to call up are the Reverend Dr. Sean James, senior pastor here at the Salton Light Church, our host, Reverend W. Lonnie Herndon, senior pastor at the Church of Christian Compassion, and Imam Kenneth Nuruddin, the resident imam at the Philadelphia Masjid. Southwest Philadelphia is a community of great pride from a very popular Facebook group called I Grew Up in Southwest Philadelphia to Tyrone Garland, who you'll remember one Sweet 16 took LaSalle to the Sweet 16 with a shot that was called the Southwest Philly Floater. People who live, work, and worship in Southwest Philly take great pride in this section of the city. And so you can imagine the pain that exists in this neighborhood right now a neighborhood that you might think is accustomed to gun violence, but the fact of the matter is this is something different. What is not different, however, is the response of the neighbors and the friends and the clergy, women and men of this community in this situation. And so I want to invite everyone this evening back here to Salt and Light. We will have our doors open the rest of the day, but tonight we'll be gathering at 7 p.m. for an interfaith citywide prayer vigil. We invite you all to come and to spend some time with us as we lament over this situation, as we gather around one another, and as we offer prayers. Let me also say this. We've been blessed at this church to have a robust mental health ministry. We have several individuals who are part of our staff who are either spiritual directors or a licensed therapist. And that is a ministry that is at no cost to anyone. You do not have to be a member of the church. And so if anyone finds themselves in a position right now where you need to talk to somebody, and we know this is an issue in the city of Philadelphia right now, I think the real issue that we are often missing in this situation is not the identity of the shooter, but rather the issues of mental health that exist in our city and how difficult it is for individuals to find the help that they need right now. And so if you or someone you love or a child that is in your care needs to talk to someone right now, 
the doors of the church are open, and we would love for you to bring that person by here that we can minister to them. Again, we are gathered under circumstances which are very acute. And when we have acute problems, uh, all labels are put aside because humans are involved. And we see the response of the first responders, whether they're in law enforcement, criminal justice, or the health professionals. The job that they do is second to none, and it's very thorough. But I would like to speak to the community and remind us we are the second responders, meaning we have to come in and deal with the chronic conditions. So just as the first responders do their job well, they can only respond to acute issues. The chronic condition is something that all of us have to respond to, and we have to commit ourselves and dedicate our efforts in that capacity. Thank you. Again, our thoughts and, and prayers go towards um, the families affected by this terrible tragedy. I want to thank the DA's office always for having their finger on the pulse of bringing faith leaders and community leaders together to help our community heal. There's a great quote that says, we do not heal in isolation, we heal in community. And tonight, join us at 7 p.m. as we uh, spend some time walking this neighborhood, praying for this neighborhood, and uh, helping this community to heal. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that was really concise for clergy. I'm very, very impressed. You got the right one. <laughs> and thank you, thank you for that. It, it is. <laughs> You know, lawyers say they're going to write a brief, but it's never brief. It's the same idea. Anyway, um, it is now my pleasure to call forward Bofi Jabatet, who is the executive director of ACANA, A-C-A-N-A. -A, that is the Africa, African Cultural Alliance of North America. Mr. Jabatet. Thank you, Lyra Krishna, or DA. And I first of all want to uh, extend our appreciation and gratitude to the 12 police district and the police officers that immediately put their own lives at stake to bring this situation under control immediately. Uh, we were here on Sunday and with uh, uh, Jordan Harris, uh, our district uh, representative, and uh, Joanna McClinton. Well, I want to leave this platform with one message. And that is, what happened in Southwest Philadelphia 56 and Chester is not isolated to 56 and Chester. It's a national issue. For people to think that we will be scared to live our life and work on 56 and Chester or Chester Avenue, Tell those who shoot randomly, tell those people who come after people who don't harm them but they want to harm others, that we will not be afraid. We will continue to build Southwest Philadelphia based on those models that all of us have accepted. I want to make sure that I am not only speaking for the African and Caribbean immigrants that live in here, but for all of the uh, folks that call Southwest Philadelphia their home. We speak with one voice. We are planning for, uh, to unify our community. We have Aracana, we have uh, 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 therapeutic services across the road. We have therapeutic services. I also speaking on behalf of the Wama family and I've been working with them since then. And uh, we will be uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we will be uh, based on uh, uh, the DA uh, uh, instruction, we will be meeting as a community to structure what is it that we'll do to heal our community quickly. And I just want to say we're not afraid. Thank you, Mr. Jabatet. It is now my pleasure to introduce two of Philadelphia's greatest defenders when it comes to public safety, when it comes to the prevention of crime and also give, tip my hat to a couple who could not be here today. We have with us Rochelle Bilal, 
our sheriff. We also have Senator Sharif Street. Um, I don't think there, I don't even want to compare them. I don't think there's anybody who's really done more to try to see what we could do at both the local and uh, statewide level to improve Philadelphia's situation. I do want to mention Senator Vince Hughes, who could not be here today, but has played such a vital role, and uh, Senator Nikhil Saval, who wanted to be here, but is doing what any good parent does, which is making sure that his family is safe and sound and well cared for. Um, I also want to tip my hat to our upstate brother in the Senate, and that is Senator Costa. There's many others I could recognize, but these are all people who work all day, every day, to try to improve things for Philadelphia, both in terms of enforcement and prevention. As you may know, there has been a community out there very vested in the prevention of crime. Uh, they have, among other things, been interested in an idea that was first published in the Inquirer, or at least the basis for it came in the Inquirer, referred to as 57 blocks. Um, I don't know exactly what these two leaders are going to tell us, but I know it's going to be important. And therefore, I call forward Sheriff Bilal and Senator Street. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office, we give our sincere condolences to the families, the victims of this senseless mass murder. With that, we are even more concerned over disturbing messages found on the assaultant's social media page. Let me congratulate those Philadelphia police officers and the Philadelphia department, my colleagues, who did a superb job in making sure that assaultant was captured. We don't have to put a warrant out for that one. That one's in custody. And I want to thank them for the work that they've done. Let us use this opportunity to re-examine social media posts we may see that mentions harming someone or suggest extreme activities. If you know this person or see a post that raises a red flag, you have to speak up and call the authorities immediately. This is our business. And we can't afford to stay silent. They are letting people know what they are about to do. And that is on all of us to not sit silent when you see these type of posters that is threatening to harm us, harm our communities, harm our children, harm somebody in society. We have to take a part in this. As the investigation continues, we ask for the community's assistance to call and report suspicious activity, unlawful gun purchase, and anything that poses a threat to you and your family. We need your help. Thank you, Sheriff, District Attorney, all those who've worked on this. Two years ago, on this day, on July 5th, 2021, I was standing here because there had been a mass shooting on July 4th, uh, 2021, in which um, Saudi Magu Lala, our nephew, uh, was killed. Standing here, full of cameras, uh, shooting on 60th Street, not on 58th, two blocks away. My wife was burst into tears, and for the first time ever, I burst into tears on camera. Um, since then, the Pennsylvania General Assembly has failed to enact fit responsible gun laws. You can still buy an AR-15, which was used in countless murders over and over again. You, they, we still haven't passed background checks. The House passed it, but my colleagues, Republican colleagues, make us be clear, in the Senate still have not called that to a vote. The reporting of loss of stolen handguns still, still is, is, is not available, which only targets straw purchasers, does nothing to individual. Uh, red flag laws, so safe storage, I could go on. 
It is absolutely ridiculous. And the only thing that could have made sitting there and looking at this worse was then I watched the mayor of Baltimore talk about the fact that there was a mass shooting there and that almost all of the guns used in mass shootings in Baltimore are purchased out of state. And I guess what, about a significant portion of those were also purchased in Pennsylvania. And I realized our failings in the General Assembly are probably not just responsible for mass shootings here in Philadelphia and throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but also responsible for shootings in all the states around us that have more, that have stricter gun laws. And what have we done recently? But the one thing that we had started to do was fund violence prevention groups something that has, has, in a very modest way, started to erode the, the crime prevention, the, what's going on. And we passed a budget out of the Senate that cut violence prevention dollars, $60 million, $65 million below what the governor proposed and what we did last year. It is an absolute atrocity. The budget process isn't done in Harrisburg. And I'm saying this as a family member of someone who died, who can understand what folks are going on. It is an absolute outrage that we would be advancing a budget that cuts violence prevention dollars while we do nothing about the flow of illegal guns, while mass shootings continue to move forward. I said when I stood in front of you, at, when it was my family member that was laying dead, along among others, was not the only person killed that day, unfortunately. I said, we stand in the church. People talk, always offer their thoughts and prayers. The book of James says, faith without works are dead. And to my colleagues across the, in the General Assembly and in Congress who want to offer faith and prayers to the victims of families and do nothing about the problem, to you I say your faith is dead if you will not do the work to deal with the issues. The victims of families want to see us do something, not just give empty promises and fake prayers. Thank you so much, Sheriff, and thank you for your passionate words, Senator Street. Uh, it is now my opportunity and pleasure to call up ADA Joanne Pescator, the Chief of the Homicide Nonfatal Shooting Unit, who supervises ADA Bob Wainwright, the prosecutor who has had this case from the beginning, and I expect will have this case until the end, they will be providing specific information about the case. If you have any questions, please hold them. We are going to make sure that you all have an opportunity to ask questions when we get to the question and answer phase. There will be uh, a couple speakers speaking together after ADA Pescator and Bob Wainwright, so I appreciate your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Wainwright. Um, I'm the Assistant District Attorney assigned to the case. Good afternoon, Joanne Pescator. I am the Chief of the Homicide Non-Fatal Shooting Unit in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. And I just want to start off by uh, stating what others before me have said. Um, my condolences go out to the families of the five murder victims. Uh, Lashid Merritt, who's 20, Dimir Stanton, who is 29, Ralph Morales, who is 59, Dijon Brown, who was only 15, and Joseph Wama Jr., who was 31. I also like uh, to send my condolences to the, uh, the the family members who were hurt and survived. Ms. Brown, Octavia Brown, who was driving in a car with three of her children, uh, she suffered a serious injury to her eye from glass. Her twin boys in the back seat, one of them suffered injury from the glass, and the other suffered gunshot wounds to his leg. And her 10-year-old daughter, who was not struck, thankfully, um, uh, but was in the passenger seat next to her, as well as the surviving complainant, the one, the one person who was struck by bullets, who was not in that car, um, who survived, uh, who was only 13 years old. I'll just, um, there were this is a, the defendant in this case um, had an AR-15 assault rifle. And uh, as it's been said already, I mean, the police work on this case was just absolutely incredible from the very beginning. The fact that they cornered this defendant before he could take more lives is absolutely remarkable and showed incredible bravery by the police officers. 
And then I got a phone call from ADA Pescator, my boss, um, shortly after the incident saying that this was going to be coming down the pipeline and to just be ready. And then I got a phone call uh, later that night um, after midnight by Detective Scally, who's not the assigned, but Detective Scally is an amazing detective in Philadelphia. And he, uh, was, he was drafting the search warrants both for the, um, the defendant's home and also the home of the uh, Joseph Wama, who had been found after the other four decedents had been, had been already found and the scene had been processed. Um, and then the assigned detective, uh, Detective Orlando Ortiz, who I've had the fortune of working with before, who's an amazing detective as well. And I just um, am thankful that we've got such great detectives and police in this city. All right, thank you very much. Obviously, both ADA Wainwright and ADA Pescator will be available for questions. They may not be able to answer all of them, but they will certainly be able to answer some of those questions. Finally, um, we have with us to speak together Josephine Wama and Jasmine Wama, who are the sisters of Joseph Wama, one of the murder victims in this case. Josephine is the twin sister of Joseph Wama, and Jasmine is also their sister. I would ask you, please, to understand the sensitivity of the situation and the respect that is um, something I know you will all convey in dealing with them. Josephine Wama and Jasmine Wama. So, I just honestly still can't believe that he's gone. I still can't believe that my brother is gone, and I just don't understand why this happened. Like, he was a kind soul. He was nice to everyone. He was good to everyone. He got on me about having grace with people. And one thing I really love and admire about him, he, he had a great sense of humor. And I'm just waiting for him to say, hey, this is a prank. But it's just like, it's hard to wake up from this. I don't understand how someone can just do that to my brother. Like, he... I really love him. And the fact that you did this to us, like, for your own agenda, for your own reason, it's just really pissing me off. It's really pissing me off. And I'm going to miss him a lot. He taught me a lot about myself. He was like a second father to me. I, didn't want, I never wanted to tell anyone that, but he was like a second father to me. He was just getting on me about things I need to do, plans. He's like, you got to plan stuff and then just do it. So he was gorgeous inside and out. I'm going to miss that beautiful smile. I really am. He had the best hugs. And he took care of his family. He had the worst cooking. He tried his best, okay, but he put his passion into it. And I just feel like with his cooking, we still ate it because he, he tried and it's just like he couldn't cook, but he could sketch his butt off. He yes. can like draw you right now all in this room with just a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper and just draw every detail of your face. Like it, it's just, he was very, very artistic, okay? When I say, a lot of these famous painters, designers, he will be just past Van Gogh. I'm sorry. I got nothing on my brother. Like, he, I, I'm going to find his artwork and just share it to the world for him on his behalf. And I know that he will want me to do that. So I'm going to find his artwork, his, all his talents and gifts, and I'm going to share it to the world. I want to make sure that I tribute it just to him because if, if you see his, his, sketch sketches and everything like there's nobody else that can like draw him and it, it was like so detail oriented it was so passionate it was so rooted and down to earth that it was just spiritual you could feel all the energy everything that he's saying in his body you could feel it on top of the canvas 
that's how deep it was. Not just like, oh, I want to be an artist. Like, you could feel this man's emotions in every stroke of the paintbrush that he puts on the canvas. Like, and he loved Creed. He loved each and every one, two, and three. That was his favorite movies. Yeah, he was obsessed with Creed. Like, Pictures, he was an actor in Creed, too. He's one yeah. of the extra actors, and it's just like, he even drew Michael B. Jordan. He drew yeah. him so well, and, and my Aunt Gloria, she came in the room and she, she cried because she felt that emotion that he felt when he painted that canvas. Like, that's a true artist right there. He was very smart. He had a degree in psychology from Chestnut Hill College. Like, he was just amazing. Like, a jerk sometimes to me. I, I'm waiting for him to get on my nerves. Like, I just, I'm just not, like, here right now. Like, I'm just not understanding that he's gone. I, I'm just really pissed off. Like, why did you have to do this to my brother? You took him away. You took an angel away from us. Why didn't you take yourself away? Jasmine, just. Okay. Why don't you just kill your fucking self? I had a nervous breakdown this morning. You shot yourself. Jasmine, just try to calm down. I know it's hard. We, we I had know. nothing but anger. It's nothing but anger. I'm sorry. You killed the wrong person. You killed the wrong man. All right. Thank you so much for your comments. The first speaker was Josephine Wama, the twin sister of Joseph Wama Jr. The second was Jasmine Wama, also their sister. We are um, open to questions and answers here, obviously within bounds. This is an ongoing investigation and the topic is not everything else. The topic is what we have been discussing today. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, first of all, I want you to know how much I respect you as a journalist. I really do. But um, if you don't mind, I would like to go from one side of the room to the other so we make sure that every journalist gets covered. We will, of course, give you your, your opportunity, sir. Uh, I, would never, I would never cut off because that is what we usually do. Let's start on this side of the room. Are there any journalists who have questions? Yes, please. Can you identify yourself, please? Thank you. Question is twofold. Number one, there's a report from the National Institute of Health Sciences that shows that this individual, this Okay, so that I understand, Ms. Kent, your second question is about social media. We're not going to comment on social media at this time because the investigation is ongoing, especially with reference to any thinking or any motive that may have been behind what we all recognize now was um, essentially a random shooting. It was a shooting of people that the defendant did not know, and it was a shooting of people who, in many cases, did not even know each other, despite being from the same neighborhood. So given the ongoing nature, we're not going to talk about social media. Um, I have to apologize. Can you ask me the first part of the question again? We're not going to comment on all the specifics of the investigation. Certainly, a number of news outlets have raised the possibility that there may be mental health issues. If there are mental health issues, those are normally addressed by uh, expert examinations that are ordered by the court during the course of a prosecution. That has not been ordered yet, although I expect that it will be. Is there another question on this side? Yes, sir. And Mr. Petrillo, can you identify your outlet? Uh, Matt Petrillo, CBS News, Philadelphia. Can you tell us what was found during the search of this home? 
Um, I'm going to defer, I do know, but I'm going to defer to um, ADA Pescator and ADA Wainwright to answer that. To the extent they can. Uh, you mean the search of the defendant's home? Um, there was a, uh, a 380, uh, 380 caliber handgun. Um, there was also ammunition, 223 ammunition. Uh, there were the, there were live rounds that matched the uh, ammunition found at the scene. The 42, um, actually, the, the main scene was 42 FCCs of 223, and then there were additional FCCs located um, at Mr. Wama's residence later on. Um, in addition, uh, there was a will. Uh, that was dated June 23rd in the defendant's handwriting. Um, in addition to, I'll just add that in addition to the AR-15 that the defendant had on him when he committed uh, these atrocities, he, um, he had a, an additional handgun, a 9 millimeter handgun uh, that was actually a ghost gun, uh, not traceable. Um, that, that gun does not appear to have been fired during the rampage. Only the AR-15 was used, but he did have a second gun on him. Could you describe what the bill said? No. I don't, I, I don't, and I don't have that information in front of me. This is... Did it mention during it, did this rampage happen? No, not, not to my knowledge. Were, were there any other suspects apprehended, or will any more suspects be taken into uh, There was initially, um, there was a suspect that was taken into custody initially. Um, and that suspect was released. And the circumstances surrounding that, that individual were, as it turned out, somewhat straightforward. That individual uh, lost his brother, was one of the decedents. Um, that individual had a gun on him that was legally owned and possessed. Um, and when his brother was shot and he saw that his brother was shot, that individual fired seven shots in the direction of the defendant. Sir, can you I'm not a news person. Sir, can you hold on? I will make sure oh, yeah. that we get to talk to you. To all the news I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I am now blessed with a list of people, and therefore it becomes a little bit easier to manage um, a series of questions. Mr. Cole, do you have a question? Uh, Ms. Pescator, do you know what was in the will? Have you read the will? I. I, Mr. Cole, I have not read the will. However, it's an ongoing investigation, and I wouldn't want to divulge uh, what was actually in there, even if I did know. The shooter, you talk about somebody who's licensed to carry who shoots seven shots at the, uh, at the accused here. Does he hit him at all? Where no. the shots come he from? He does not. He does not hit him. No, he was released. Uh, he has a permit to carry, and he had a lawfully owned firearm. He was not charged. The, uh, the accused here has a 2004 conviction carrying without a license. Uh, does that have any impact here, any impact on him carrying these guns? Uh, well, he would legally not be able to have a firearm based on the fact that that was a, he does have a conviction. Um, however, he would not be 6105 to, for the, I believe, the conviction back in 2004 was only a misdemeanor. So he was not charged in this particular case with a felon not to have a firearm. So he actually, while he's not licensed to carry, Right. That's his violation here. He's not, hadn't been licensed to He wouldn't carry. be eligible to get a license to carry it based on his previous conviction for that case. What do you know about the AR-15? How long he had it, where it came from, where he got it? Uh, Mr. Wainwright might be able to answer that. I, I don't have that information yet at this time. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with the detectives later on about that. Okay. Um, do not fear. I will get to everyone, I promise. Um, all right. Tasani Vejpongsa, uh, please, I apologize if I got your name wrong, from AP, Associated Press. Oh, um, Do you have sorry. any questions or no? No, 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 I didn't. no questions? Okay, thank you. A Adam Fox from CBS 3. What? Adam Fox? I'm a member. Okay. I've been reading the list of the crew members. Oh, okay. Well, let me just make sure I don't miss anybody. If you don't have a question, just feel free to say no questions. Kenyatta Henderson, Fox 29. No questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Bruce Ryan, NBC 10. Okay, very good. Well, in that case, let us go to Rosemary Connors of NBC 10.
speak at all to the motive in this case and perhaps any plan.